Uh oh. Uh, <laughs> welcome, welcome to the Big Box PC Game Collectors Vidcast. Uh, today we are very happy to have James Simpson with us from Cell Block Studios, uh, famous for Snarf Quest Tales, the uh, successful Kickstarter he's been working on. James, how the heck are you, buddy? I am great. How are you doing there? I'm doing awesome. So, uh, Snarf Quest Tales. I'm going to give a little bit of a history here for any of those young whippersnappers who may not know who Snarf is. Right. Uh, it's not uh, related to uh, Thundercats at all, despite what Stuart Feldhammer would tell you. We, we were uh, offered money to make a Thundercats joke at this point <laughs> recording. I should emphasize that we all turned down this bribe. <laughs> Although I just did it, so what does that mean? Uh, that was Snarf... more meta. <laughs> Snarf officially showed up uh, uh, in the pages of Dragon Magazine, uh, which, uh, if you're uninitiated, is uh, quite possibly some of the best bathroom reading on the face of the planet. Uh, <laughs> issue, he, he showed up for the first time in issue number 75, which I happen to have right here in my hand. Okay. Uh, the artist who created Snarf is Larry Elmore. Um, Larry Elmore, for those who may not know, is most famous for... Um, his work on the Dungeons & Dragons sets. He painted these uh, paintings here from the uh, basic to expert rules and stuff. Probably single-handedly along with uh, Jeff Easley and uh, Dennis Lubay set in people's minds what fantasy was supposed to look like. He probably is more responsible for Dungeons & Dragons blowing up him and those other folks that I mentioned than anyone because their artwork sold just tons of boxes. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, how did you get hooked up with Larry Elmore in the first place? Well, I've been a friend. Uh, well, I've been a fan of Larry since uh, Dragonlance covers is what got me it started. Uh, so I I was at a I was in middle school and I was at a like a book fair. So I went there and there was this there was this blue book and it had these three characters and they were just staring at me and I'm like that that's just truly amazing and I picked it up and I flipped through the pages and the pages felt like I was touching butterfly wings. I was like, this is so gorgeous and beautiful. So I started reading it, and I got about, I don't know, 30, 40 pages into it, and I realized, this seems like I'm missing a whole subsection. This is book two. Okay, then so I, then I found out there was a book one, so I went and read uh, the, uh, the Dragonlance of uh, Autumn of, the Autumn one. Uh, read that, and then I, you know, I finished two, and now I was like one of those books I couldn't wait to get to number three. Um, so Larry Elmore actually came to Pensacon, uh, 90, 93, 92, we'll say 92, 93, where I was living in some kind of, let's see, not say a bad word, uh, Florida, uh, I was living in the Panhandle of Florida, which, uh, it sucks for me, because I'm actually from Alaska, so moving from Alaska to Florida was not a good experience at all, and, uh, it's one of those things, like, you know, I kind of want global warming to happen, just enough to take Florida off the map. Once that happens, I'm all good for, uh. <laughs> You know, stopping global warming. But once Florida leaves, okay, we're good. Just, just please let Florida disappear. Floridians, so, please note that the opinions of guests are not endorsed by the big box PC game collectors. Thank you. Remember, <laughs> just the Panhandle area. I'll be fine if that goes underwater. I mean, Miami's not too bad. Uh, uh, Orlando's really good. Fort Lauderdale, they're okay. But that Panhandle area, not a fan. So anyway, I'm actually in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, since '94, and then Larry came to the convention. I'm like, oh my god, I'm starting to put all these things together. This is the guy who, uh, you know, did all these other things too. I just do them from Dragonlance. He did, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons, the red box, the blue box, the green box, the, the one uh, Joel just showed. I'm like, holy crap, this guy is awesome. And I asked, in Alaska, I actually read some of Dragon Magazine. My next door neighbor actually had Dragon Magazine. I said, this is awesome. So that's how I knew of Snarf, Dungeons and Dragons, and then Dragonlance put all that together, and they're meeting the guy who actually created all the art for it. I was like, this is phenomenal. So as a fanboy, every year I make sure I go by and visit Larry, get a print or whatever. And then more does classes. Now I'm a I'm an engineer, I'm not an artist, but I was like, I get to spend a week with Larry and an inn made in, in 1770 in Kentucky and drink and learn how to draw from Larry. Uh yeah, I'll do that. So I went hung out there and did the week course and I learned how to draw a little bit. A, a, a little bit. He did good. Um, but it was great to just sit down and talk with Larry for this entire time. And then we got to know each other. So over the course of many years, we've we've talked a lot more. And I've always wanted to do one of his games based upon Snarf Quest. I said, hey, Larry, this was, two, this was uh, what year is this, 2016, 15? In 2014, yeah, 2014, in August 8th, 
uh, I'm talking with Larry on the phone. He's like, James, you know, you've been such a good friend and everything. And you've been talking about wanting to do a Snarf Quest game. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I'll go ahead and give you my permission to use it. Now, what's really important to understand is when Larry was at TSR creating all this iconic image, um, he needed something to do for himself. He told Gary Gaiax, he's like, look, I'm tired of building all this other stuff for you guys. I need something to do. And he's like, well, I have a magazine, you know, Dragon Magazine. You could do something and be published in there. So that's why he created Starf Quest. And it was like three panels and published. And the syndication or the publication uh, subscriber base when Starf Quest came out started to go up big time. So, of course, they kept them on. Um, then, obviously, things at TSR were not the greatest. They kept wanting to do more sci-fi. It was a Bowser, not Bowser Collective. Buck Rogers was the big thing they wanted to push towards instead of Dungeons and Dragons, like which was known for. So he left there, but this was Larry's first IP that he created. This is his, you know, his pride and joy. So when Larry told me I, he's giving me permission to use his IP, I'm like, this is fantastic. He's like, you know, James, why don't you come to Dragon Con? You can show it off. Now remember, Larry's an artist. He's not a game programmer. So I'm like, thanks, Larry. And I got tears running out my face going, wait a minute, Dragon Con's in three weeks. I know you can do it. So I had to build an entire game to show off at Dragon Con at Larry Elmore's booth in three weeks. So, to make a long story short, I'm trying to think of different types of scenarios for what Snarf would be. Well, he's not a hack and slash. He's not, he's, he's not a first-person shooter. Um, he's not really a side-scroller platform. The entire comic book is based upon an adventure that he's going on. It starts off the first panel the, in his Zifa village that the king has died. The first one that actually gets the most gold or the most treasure in one year will become king. So his entire quest is to go get gold for an entire year. So I'm like, that works with a point-and-click adventure game. And I've worked on some point-and-click adventure games before. So I was like, well, let's just go ahead and do that. So me and a team of two other people, Jonathan Thomas and uh, Brandon Packer, she was the environmental artist. Jonathan was the, uh, the character creation, so all the characters were, well, most of the characters were done by him. Then I was the engineer putting this together. And sure enough, in three weeks, we had a very playable uh point-and-click adventure game. It's about 45 minutes of gameplay if you don't know what you're doing. It's about 25 minutes you could do. Um, but it has everything. It has rigging, animation, has music effects, it has sound effects, it's, it's, you know, lighting. It's, it's just gorgeous. And we were really amazed that we got that done in that short amount of time. Now, there are some hiccups, you know, because we threw it together so fast. But a lot of people were playing the demo going, this is really good. You guys are onto something here. But I didn't want to do a Kickstarter. And I'm sitting there building this game and I'm like, do I want to do a Kickstarter? Do I want to self-fund this, or do I want to ask for people for money? And that was a hard decision. Um, so when Kickstarter first came out, it was, oh, this is a great idea. You can give money, and you can possibly get a product, and you're in, the, you're, you're in the game, and you're in the credits and everything. That was great. But then I started to see a trend where a lot of people were basically trying to do this like to supplement their salaries. They would ask for $150,000, $200,000 to build a game that would probably cost 5000 to make, but they would always think, well, let's see, if I need to basically not work at another company for a year and I make, oh, I don't know, 80000 a year, so I need to pay 80000 plus $20,000 to actually build the game, and they overcharge themselves and they don't get funded, or vice versa, where people don't actually scope out how much a product actually costs to make. Um, and that's, that's a scary situation if you've never worked on a game before. And then a lot of people will basically underfund their game, get kickstarted, and then not finish the product. So I saw a lot of Kickstarters failing for those two things. And that scared me to do it. I was like, you know what? Thank you. Thank you, guys. And, you know, 2014, I'm glad the reception was really good. Um, I'm thinking about self-funding this. So I started working on it, working on it. And as I uh, did some more investigation, like finding out how much box costs and getting all the product materials and everything, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I can't Kickstarter this. So I, I spent seven months. Is that right? Yeah, January to June, um, researching how much it really costs to build this without putting any money towards my salary or uh, any any real money towards salary because this is a passion product of mine. You know, Larry's let me use his Starquest property. This is awesome. So with that being said, uh, we decided to go ahead and do a Kickstarter on, Ju on June. I'm sorry, July 30th, and uh, not July. Yeah, July 30th, and we would start at Gen Con. And we end at Dragon Con. So in theory, we start at a convention and then at a convention. And these are two rather large gaming people. Uh, these are people who would know Snarf Quest. And it went very well. It was uh, I'm not a marketer. Uh, I'm actually I'm an engineer. But I thought I did really well with getting the word out and everything. Now what 
I wish I would have got my goal a little sooner because I saw like on the last day when it hit its thirty thousand dollar goal, it started skyrocketing. It went to like thirty seven in like twenty. It went seven thousand in uh, twenty four hours. I'm like, wish I would have got there a little bit earlier. But otherwise, we were really happy with it. Um, I was it was it was it really heart pounding whether when you when you were getting close to the wire. Well, the way if you haven't done a Kickstarter, the way it works is uh, you get these little emails every time somebody pledges or, or or backer, you get an email. But what happens is sometimes you have people either reduce their pledge or remove their pledge completely. So you know, my phone's going ding, and your heart's on a roller coaster. It's like, is it money up or is it money down? You know, then you see that. And sometimes one of the larger tiers was like the hundred dollar tier, which was you get the shirt, you get a you get a box, you get a whole bunch of things, and uh, you know, we would get like twenty nine nine ninety seven, and then somebody would remove their hundred dollar tier. I'm like, oh my, this is insane. So like for a, and you know, you don't want to spam people. You try, you try not to go to Facebook and like every five minutes, you know, don't you know, come by and see. You want to make sure your post is on top. Uh, you tr you desperately try to do that, but then you get to the anxiety where you feel like you have to do that. So that was hard to do and hard, hold yourself back. And it was like at twenty nine nine ninety seven. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and send another Facebook post. And as I was hitting enter, my wife and uh, uh, the, we had a girl dressed up as Tillery. Uh, how do I share with this thing? Uh, we had a girl dressed up as Tillery. Obviously, there's me. This is Larry. This is my wife, Sandra. And uh, Sandra put her hand on my right shoulder. And I was like, oh, my God, such a thing. So with that. <laughs> I didn't send the message. And I'm like, oh my God, we got it. Now, the cool thing about Kickstarter is once you actually get it, people can't remove their pledge because there's a lot of people that have recently screwed a bunch of companies where they have pledged over the amount and then, you know, at the last moment pulled out. So people are asking for $50,000 and someone did a $10,000 tier uh, at the last moment, pulled out the last moment, so now they're underfunded. So, uh -huh. yeah, so uh, they have fixed that. And... See, that's October. When is Gen Con? Let's back that up. We're trying to find pictures here. It's when like we... a month for Dragon Con, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so that was at, uh, that was, uh, at uh, Dragon Con 2014, and that's you know Larry there. And it was funny, too, because I got there at night. Larry comes in from Kentucky, and I got there at night. And so he's setting up his booth, and I'm setting up my stuff. He's like, he's never played it. So he sat, I got a video of him playing it, and he gets to the end. And, uh, How do you like it? That's what I'm saying. He got to the end. He's like, uh, you know, it says the little, uh, says the uh, the ending part. He's like, so where's the rest of it? I'm like, Larry, I only had three weeks to do this. He's like, I want to, I want to play the rest. I'm like, he sat. He's not a, you know, gamer. He's, you know, he he's a fancy artist, and uh, so it was nice of him going. I want to play the rest. I'm like, holy crap, this is good. So this was all really good. And when you're, when you're, that's why you don't see me with the the Snarf Quest T-shirt because it didn't exist at that time. Um, let's see here. Now, while researching all this stuff that I was trying to do for the Kickstarter, um, one of the things that I want to make sure is I have good voice talent. Now, I did the original voice of Snarf, so if you played that demo, which I think I stopped screen sharing, but if you played that demo, the voice you hear is me in this demo right here. So basically, there was a guy named John Bailey. He is known for uh, Honest Trailers. Have you guys ever heard of Honest Trailers? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he is now the voice of Snarf. Um, oh, wow, that's oh. great. That's yeah. great. Um, also, for those who don't know, do you guys know a guy named Paul Jenkins? He's a comic book artist. He created the Inhumans and did uh, Wolverine Origins. Okay, yep. Okay, that's him right there. So we just did a voiceover session. And I have some of his, so he's, he's from London, so he's got a thick British accent. I don't know if you can hear this. My sword is short. My sword is short. <laughs> yep, that's some quality history English, that is. <laughs> One, but never lands. So uh, we, did, we did a whole uh, voiceover session. Let me see, what is this one? How do you know? So we had to do it like three How times, do you know? and then I get to pick which one I like. How do you know? And he was he was talking about all these different uh, you know dialects in, in in Europe, and I'm like, I'll go with whatever you want. And it was you know fantastic. So having the Kickstarter done, I'm getting to meet all these people 
that are kind of like, hey, we want to help out because a lot of them are StarQuest fans. So I'm like, well, this is great. So we did the Kickstarter, it got funded, and now it's, you know, I actually have to do the work. I'm like, okay. So I went ahead and uh, last year, at, right after the Kickstarter, I got all the supplies. I have all the books. The only thing I do not have in my room right this moment is the shirts. Um, the shirts, they're very expensive. Um, the company I was dealing with, is good quality shirts, but you have to order a lot of them. And I was hoping for a little bit higher numbers for that. Usually the shirts, they're like $33 a piece. And I'm like, great, this is not good. But if you order in great quantity, obviously they go down. So I managed to get the numbers down to a more reasonable amount than $33 a piece. Um, but I want to do that at the last moment. Uh, with the Kickstarter, we're supposed to be done by October. Now, I don't know why I said 2016. I said 2017. Yeah, all the backers should have their Steam keys, and I want to make sure they work. Um, from that, I'm going to be shipping out in October every, all the supplies except for the DVD. So you should be able to get a... If you did a, a box edition, you'll get a box with your Steam key in it. Um, but I'll just media mail you guys the DVD when I finish. But therefore, products are actually delivered and delivered on time, except for the game itself. And, I've been and so that means that people are going to get the full functional game on the disc as, as uh, when it's completely finished, rather than having sort of a glorified coaster in a, in a box. That's correct. Okay. There are a lot of people, and that was one of the great things about actually going to the conventions and me meeting these people. A lot of people are, I don't want to say in fear of Steam, but they don't like Steam's policies. I completely respect that. They don't want the game through digital distribution. A lot of them don't even have internet access. It was interesting because Kickstarter doesn't have a, an app for Android, but they have one for I, uh, iOS. So what happens is sometimes you get people who don't even have a smartphone, and they're like, well, how do I give you money? I was like, well, you have to go online, create a Kickstarter account. It's like, I don't have internet. Uh, okay. So I had to think of you know creative ways to have these people sign up because I just can't take funds because in theory I could just steal your funds. We didn't want to have we didn't want to have any problem with that. So I would actually get on the internet and help create them an account for them. And they're like, well you gonna send me a DVD? Absolutely. I'll go ahead and send those people a DVD. So yes, I'm gonna ship out everything I have on time because I have everything. I could ship it up now, but I want to make sure the boxes. So I had this box printed for, let me see my camera. Can you guys see this while well, well, the glare? So this is the box printed. The problem is the that's a really bad glare. Uh, uh, the dragon, really, came out... Well, I'm sorry, he's a duck. Came out really, really, really dark. So we have the new ones, which I can share with you. Is this an exclusive? Oh, actually, you're going to get exclusive here in just a moment of something different. It's so sad that I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, world, <laughs> per, world premiere. Alternate versions. Okay, now, you guys... No one... Um, yeah. How many people? Let's see. Even Larry hasn't seen this yet. So I can say only three people have seen this. Let me scribe this over there. Let's click on screen share and there. That is the official red box that will be printed. Yeah. So I am trying to keep with the actual aspect of the original Dungeons & Dragons box. Now time out. You did that yourself. No, my, I have an artist that does it for me. I mean, he's the guy who's Walter Stevens. He's actually my dungeon master when we play Dungeons & Dragons, so one of my close friends. Yeah, my best friend is a guy named Michael Foster, who I've known since 1984. So, Shout out. Yes. That one um, I little thing on there on the side panel. What Where about right, right here? That. What does that mean? The set one, Starquest rules. If you yeah. look at the original Dungeon Dragons uh, box, you will see that there was a sticker that was on there telling you this was set one. So okay. it's homage exactly to the original love box. It. Love it. I really should have brought my D&D box up with me. Yeah. The only thing that's different was uh, the back. Uh, the back normally is white, but we wanted to have kind of the flyer that you kind of have there, Joel, that you showed earlier today. And this is for, obviously, for me to put a sticker there for the ISBN. Now... The other exclusive you get is so what's one what's I mean we talked about the the video games let me go back to we talked about games that we grew up with okay and one of the things I want to make sure that the game was representing was games like King's Quest Space Quest Leisure Suit Larry okay there was something really and even Ultima 
there was something really famous that was really good with those uh, games. And what was the number one thing people loved about those boxes? The well, stuff that came in. Feelings! It's all about the feelings. For the past week, I have been working on this. Oh, it's yeah. beautiful. It's the map. We it's will amazing. have a cloth map. That's so oh, that's cool. beautiful. Yes. I have such box envy now. Is this an exclusive as well? Yes. I mean, nice. except for the artist and uh, my my friend Walter uh, and my wife, and obviously. Uh, that's it. That's a, Oh, I'm sorry. And Larry has seen this one because he's the one that gave the final approval on it. Is, uh, is this the, the official Larry Elmore map? Like, I don't know that I ever saw a SnarfQuest map for the is universe. That Sean pa- well, which book do you have of SnarfQuest? Or do you have uh, any? Books? I just have the original magazines. I don't have the bound one. Okay, it was actually number 56. Uh, how can I show you guys Damn, this? I love that you know this. Snarfquist Tales. I'm also the only person on the planet that has a PDF of Snarfquist Tales. Let's see here. Oh, Snarfquest. Oh, guys, uh, as a comic, it, it, I can't, through. I can't uh, stress enough just how beautiful Snarf was as a comic yeah, book. There we are. So this was, Larry did two maps inside SnarfQuest, and it was uh, this one and then this one. So let me see if I can kind of put these side by side. So a lot of it looks like Europe, so you'll see, uh, you know, this would be like the Mediterranean more or less, and then this would be where the UK would be, uh, and then you would have, you know, some, some Spain and France over here. But as you can see this map, if I, I don't think I can actually rotate this, but you can see how this is laid out. So this is the actual map. If you looked in the, on the in the comic strip, you will see this layout. Exactly the same unknown lands, unknown lands, same kind of font. So I try to keep everything authentic to the map. So cool. That's beautiful. I just I'm ecstatic about this. And the other one is I have these little so I have all the miniatures of Snarf Quest. And there's actually eleven little miniatures that was done by Ralph Para. So there's actually what? Hillary. Aww. So what, one of the other things we're going to be trying to do is we're going to try to put together um, this is uh, this is Ethia. I don't know if that's focusing right. I don't think that's focused. I think it's just focusing on me. Nope, that's going to help. So we have that. We're going to be uh, distributing the, the cloth map should be ready for Gen Con and obviously Dragon Con. Because that's one of the things that bugged me the entire time is I couldn't find out the price of getting um, maps made. It oh really, really God. bothered me. So uh, Heather and I stopped by uh, the Elmore booth the first year. I told this before we got started, but uh, we uh, we kept the swag. And this is the flyer you were mentioning earlier uh, that ended up on the back of the box. Right. Because, because I'm less, psychotic, yeah. so I keep this stuff, you know. Uh and then these are the, some cards you, you gave out. Uh-huh. The code has been used already, so I don't think it, that matters. Right. And then last year, we also kept the oh, code yeah. cards you gave last like year. That. Yep. And you were nice enough to give me one of the boxes that was there. Yeah. There, there's, oh. only, there's only 11 of those printed, and I literally only have four left of my name. I actually had an order just a moment ago, uh, yesterday, in fact, the 25th, uh, for one of the boxes, because I'm actually selling it on the website. Um, but yeah. It's one of my prize collections, especially because it's uh, you, both you and Elmore sign it, which is excellent. Which was weird, because I'm like not used to you know, signing my name, and I was like, oh, <laughs> why do we do this? Wait, time uh, out. So you're saying there are four boxes left. Yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 let me clarify. There are four boxes left that are available? Yes. That's it. I only have four left in my in my. Possession? Yeah, in my possession. I personally think it's time for a plug. What's your website? Yeah. <laughs> you go to snarfquesttales.com, and then you click on Now Open the Snarfquest Tales Store. So you can buy the 30th Collection Anniversary. Um, you got the Mystical Plants of Sashar. You got the dun- you got the D20 rule book um, that came out. You got some miniatures, and you got here this promotional limited edition box. Now remember, this is the one with the uh, I just talked about that has the um, it's. The muted logo or the muted willy. Um, yeah, so it also has the wa- the white back you mentioned. Correct, and that's yep. an exact mimic of. In fact, if you want to show that, what do you call it? Code. Uh, what is it called? 
the QR activation code. Co oh, oh, yeah, the QR code. code. Thank you. Yes. That takes, you straight, that takes you straight to the website, too. Yeah, I kind of well, like it that. It up to the screen, everyone. <laughs> Look, <laughs> Joe's got his phone. No, could you hold that up again? <laughs> yeah, hang on. Let me get a picture of that. Sorry. Yep, so we only have, I mean, I only have four left in existence. And like I said, I just uh, got an order for one. So now, after, as soon as I ship that one, there's only three. So cool. Yes. So you mentioned you mentioned that your uh, your close friend is a dungeon master. Uh, something I'm always curious about. It seems like Dungeons and Dragons is like game design boot camp. You know, like uh, yeah, like how what kind of an influence the Dungeons and Dragons as a tabletop game have on uh, your your video gaming futures? Well, I got into programming because, like I said, I, I lived in Alaska, and uh, my father. He, he was he was pretty strict, and like if you did anything wrong, he always ground you for 30 days, and it was always 30 days in your room. So of course, being who I am, I always tried to break that as much as possible. So I was actually at my my friend's house next door, and he had Atari 400 that his, his parents had just got, and it has you know a, cart, uh, a tape cassette and a, a little disc, not disc, a cartridge in there for basic, and the keypads are kind of like inverted, kind of like a bubble kind of type, and he was he was he was showing me some something in, in the computer, like Dig Dug or something like that. And I saw this book, and I was like, "What what is this book?" He's like, "Well, it shows you how to program, the, you know, in Basic." I'm like, "Can I borrow this?" He's like, "Yeah." I said, "You know, we can probably make our own Dungeon Dragons game because you know I'll play Dungeon Dragons then." So I got home and I got home late. Okay, so I got grounded for 30 days. So I'm in my room, bored out of my mind, and I have nothing to do. So I started reading this book. So I started getting out pencil and paper, and I was coding, writing code, and referencing the book. But I had no way to, I had no way to test it because I don't have a computer. So after I got a groundation, I went over to my friend's house and typed in the code, and sure enough, I had a little sprite dancing on there. And I was like, "Well, that's pretty cool." He's like, "How did you learn how to do that?" So remember that book you loaned me? So, uh, so that's how I started programming, writing it out on paper, and that was, uh, yeah, 19, it was 1982 with uh, Michael Early. What's his name? Um, so. And he, you know, he had all these little A, D, and D figures, and we would, you know, we we play Dungeon Dragons. We didn't know what we were doing. So, moving up here, I got to play Dungeon Dragons a lot more, and it's constant problem solving. Walter is a very good storyteller. So when he does his, uh, when we play Dungeon Dragons, I mean, everything is. It's like you're walking into a novel. Okay, it's like you're reading a Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman book. It's like you know, he just gives you so much information, and then you have to, you know, and he always sets it up. And he has a set of things that he wants you to do. That's what all Dungeon Masters want you to do. And, of course, our job as players is to make sure we don't follow anything that he wants you to do. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's actually a lot of fun. There's a lot of creativeness. There's a lot of problem solving. There's a lot of uh, working with partners and making sure you have the right equipment. And that leads into game design. So, you know, uh, when, you, when you program something, yeah, you can have a character move from point A to point B. But as an engineer, you make sure that they do everything not to make sure they don't do anything else crazy with the character. You want to make sure they move from point A to point B, like not walk through a wall, not, not turn off gravity, uh, make sure they're facing the right direction. So you are you have to make sure you're instrumental in making sure the character is doing exactly what you want to do. Um, I teach at the Art Institute of Atlanta here in Atlanta, and one of the things I tell my students all the time is I says, you guys, as engineers, are basically deities. You know, you guys are gods. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, well, you think about this. You're telling a computer to do something, and then that, in turn, goes out and has minions playing it, doing exactly what you told them to do. Not, you know, you're not hitting all these extra keys. You're only doing what you're allowed. And they go, yeah, I never thought about that way. I'm like, yeah, you're, you're gods. And they're like, oh, that's really cool. So... Um, it, it's I've been doing game design for many years, and working with Walter, um, it's just fantastic. Uh, Joel is our resident DM, and we have uh, really messed him up on occasion. There was one time he prepped this whole adventure, and he wrote like 11 pages, and we like completely negated seven pages because we burned the village to the ground. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I actually stopped pre-writing stuff for my Paranoia game and just started started having rough notes and making things up as I went along. My players were that bad. Then yeah, again, Paranoia. Uh, 
it's hard to run a game like that, though. Yeah, it must be nice to be an engineer and do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a we have what's called a thirty thousand pound duck. For whatever reason, we had to cast in a large spell, and it misfired, and it, and it hit a duck. And we realized <laughs> there is no problem you can't solve with a thirty thousand pound duck. I mean, take out a village, thirty thousand pound duck. Get across this river, thirty thousand pound duck. Get over to another area, thirty thousand. It, it solves all problems. So obviously, you get enlarging this. We did carrying around this poor duck, you know. So we'd always enlarge it and then shrink it back. It's like, okay, obviously this is going to get nerfed here in a little bit. But for a while there, it was a great duck. Have you actually identified the best superpower of all superpowers? Yes, the enlarged. An enlarging duck. <laughs> It had to do with uh, the size and the weight, and we're doing a calculation. Is that right? A 30,000-pound duck? Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. How does that affect aerodynamics anyway? Uh, moving onwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned that one of the, uh, a, lot of pe a lot of people uh, do tend to overstretch themselves on, on Kickstarter, and that's quite a notorious problem, whereas it, you, know, you guys have, kept, you guys have quite, kept quite tight on it. You mentioned uh, in the pre-show in the pre -show that, you, uh, that uh, one of the things you were nervy about was, uh, was the uh, murky realm of post, uh, postage. How did you work that out? Uh, well, uh, we actually, you can actually log online to the USPS, and you can actually download their APIs. And we started um, checking out where we want to ship at. When we actually launched our Kickstarter. We weren't doing international sales at all. We was like no international. We, if you want international, we have to you have to contact us. But we were starting to get a huge demand from from France and from Germany and from uh, the UK, constantly saying, "Hey, why aren't you shipping to us?" And we're like, "Because we really don't know how much is this going to cost." So we went to the USPS and we downloaded their API, which gives us dynamic charges. So we measured all the boxes and we found out, you know, what flat rate compared to overnight, compared to first class, and that took about, you know, we're, I'm at I'm at Gen Con and I got Walter doing all this research and I'm constantly telling people we'll get back to you here and just get back to you here in a moment, and it took about four days to actually get that narrowed down to a price that we felt comfortable. We actually have two tiers, so if you're in the U.S., you get one price. And you get another one. Yeah, we're going to lose some money. UK is by far the most expensive place to ship to. Singapore is like the second cheapest place to uh, ship to. I'm like, I don't even know how that even works. I don't know if there's some kind of tariffs or whatever that they're doing like that. So we just kind of did an overall average and just hoped that UK wasn't going to bombard us. Uh, but it actually averaged out pretty well. And I think we're out a little bit of cash for the international shippers. But, I mean... It, we, we, we knew that was going to happen. So that's why there's actually two tiers. So when you ever do a Kickstarter, or when, when you go to a Kickstarter and you see there's two tiers for pricing, it's because of shipping. Shipping is just so astronomical, huge. The other thing is, we didn't know about this box right here, how big we actually wanted to make it. Um, you know, we, I printed these up, and I'm like, do we want to make this ship uh, uh, thinner? But we, want, we wanted to make sure people had something in their hand. The biggest thing about this, especially with shipping, we want to make sure when you put this on your shelf that it feels too thin and if it flips over, we don't want something to crush it. So that's why the box is uh, 1.57, almost 2 inches thick, okay, because we don't want this box to get crushed. A lot of people probably won't even open this box. In fact, wait, whoa. Uh -oh. I hope this one has a steam key in it. Yeah, it does. Okay. Um, we want to make sure that we send you a nice big... Uh, bundle and make sure this fits in that box perfectly. So it's like a big jigsaw put it, puzzle putting it in the box. So that was really scary. The, the shipping was the most scariest part. Uh, out of everything on the Kickstarter, the shipping was probably, because that was the one unknown that we had no earthly control over, because we didn't know where people were going to be uh, coming in from. That's why it took, like I said, about four days before we actually enabled uh, international shipping. And of course, when you're launching your Kickstarter, they let you make changes to your Kickstarter rewards, but you can't change tiers once somebody gets in it. But the good news was shipping, we, we got it there in time, so we are good there. Excellent. Um, it, it sounds to me as though uh, you really have an innate sense of uh, production. I mean, all around global production. I mean... You made it sound as though you've never done anything like this before, not start to finish. Right. But you have this, I mean, 
uh, uh, the options that you collected for the audio that you mentioned earlier. I mean, that was very insightful. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, you, do you have long-term experience with video game production or movie creation production or anything like that? Well, I mean, as an engineer, I'm forced to think logically. It's called FDLC, Full Development Life Cycle. We have to think of uh, uh, how things are going to work at the beginning and how things work at the end. I was working for a company called Inexile, which did Wasteland 2, and I did some of the GUI on Wasteland 2. And they were telling me about how their process works, and I'm like, well, that's more or less how I've been doing it. So I got to work with a lot of different gaming companies over my career that the way I think is the way things have been run. And that's why when I see Kickstarters, it, it bothers me. I mean, I actually reduced my, quick, my Kickstarter. I thought I used to back a lot of people here in Atlanta, but I used to see a lot of people fail, and a lot of people, I can look at their stuff, and I'm like, A... You don't have enough money to build that. I mean, I already know uh, there was one recently that the Wii U developer kit, um, the guy was like, we're going to put on Wii U. And he's like, his entire goal was $5,000. I'm like, the Wii, U, the Wii U development kit is 3500 by itself. How are you even going to remotely, and you know, like the, or the Xbox development kit? I'm like, well, that's two grand or free. Now it's free, but before it, was, you know, it cost a lot of money. I'm like, you're making promises that, you haven't really investigated what's really going to be needed. And then, you know, they were going to ship out uh, DVD boxes, and the price was, uh, they had nothing for shipping. And I'm like, you, you've got to be more prepared, especially for Kickstarter. Like, I think the Kickstarter, it helps you, it kickstarts your business. That's what it's supposed to do. It's not just supposed to give you an influx of money for you to go out and buy a car with it or something like that. But it, it when they when you fill out the different tiers, you're, forced to start thinking, wait, this is how it really should be working. And a lot of people just like, uh, you know, I just want to get my Kickstarter out there to get some money to whatever, pay my rent or whatever like that. <laughs> but uh, I, I liked how Kickstarter broke it out. Uh, but the, the scariest thing was was uh, uh, shipping. Because, you know, that you never know where people are going to come from. And that you, that you have no control over. But, yeah, I mean, I've always, you know, like playing with Legos. I mean, that's one of the greatest things I ever played with when I was younger. Uh, I had some medical problems, and I was in the hospital for long periods of time. So my mother would come and visit me, and she'd bring me Legos, and I'd you know build the Legos according to instructions, and then I'd hide the instructions under my uh, blanket, and then I'd sit there and build something else. I'd make, make an airplane or a helicopter or whatever else. So I've always built things from ground up and doing it different ways, and that's one of the things I think differently than other people. That's amazing. I mean, I mean, it sounds like you have it all together and know all those pieces. I think it's funny that I see other people, they have some of these innate qualities that they just seem to know, and then other ones, they totally get lost. And you go, how could you miss this obvious spot right here? And it looks like you have all these bases covered. It's fantastic. Well, yeah, well, I tried to relive the 1980s. There are a plethora of jokes inside SnarfQuest. Um, I'm like, well, what made my 80s childhood and early adulthood fun? What, what was so great about it? You know, I remember watching, like, Back to the Future. So I was like, okay, I'm going to have a DeLorean in my game. I was like, I can't show an actual DeLorean, but I can fake it. And then I found out I can't put a DeLorean in there. So that works. Um, and then, you know, what some of the games that I like? Well, I remember watching, uh, playing Leisure Suit Larry just because it had porno in it. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's a good idea. Um, that so was, I think that was most of our motivations for playing Legislate Larry. Not that it didn't turn out to be an amazing game, but yeah. oh god, Larry 3 was a masterpiece of design. Yeah, so when you hit Control B, it pulled up the Excel, uh, like a fake Excel, uh, ex Excel, Excel? spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah, eggshell. Um, <laughs> Excel spreadsheet. And it was if you it had like little bar graphs. So if you were playing it at work, I think it's Control B, and like Boss Boss B. Boss B or something like that, yeah. And it showed a little pie chart, or I mean, a little graph chart, and it actually said condoms on it. So if they really looked at your screen, they were like, what are you looking at condoms for? <laughs> but I always thought that was pretty funny. So it was little things like that. Um, I remember the uh, one of the things I kind of wanted to do but didn't do was like the coded wheel. Um, mm -hmm. Bard's Tale, the 1985 version of Bard's Tale, is hands down my favorite game of all times. I have... Way too many copies of Bard's Tale. I actually have a shrink wrap version with the Sears uh, 4995 uh, uh, cost on it. See, it's, it's a shrink wrap. It's a, it's a shrink wrap guy. I knew there was something I liked about it. <laughs> yeah, that shrink wrap and signed by Brian Fargo. So you know, I, I things like that. I'm like, this is this is great. 
that PC speaker song that played on Bard's Tale is, is like burned into my memory. <laughs> like every once in a while, it just it just plays over and over and over. You're well, going to have to show us some of your get your game collection since I, you I, you've got to mention that you've got these. Yeah, I have a lot of you know, SSI games, and obviously, for those who don't know, I have the Bad Blood Still Shrink Rep signed by Warren Spector himself, and of course, uh, cover art by Larry Elmore. So. That is such an underrated game. It is. And uh, I've actually talked to Warren about, you know, seeing if I could redo it. But we'll, I want to get one, done, one, one game done at a time. So. KG's face just then was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. He's trying to get the rights to Epic Mickey back from Disney. <laughs> to hit because you can go, come on, you know exactly where I'm sitting right now. Yes. Yeah, I, I, have, I have some PC games. Um, a, lot of, a lot of mine are signed, so... Um, that was one of the great things I like about it. But yeah, so 1985 Bard's Tale, hands down my favorite game. And from there, I knew at a very well, young age what I wanted to be, which was a game programmer. So that has directed my life. I like my, my my mother. God, I love my mother. But you know, she she's an older woman, and she doesn't have a clue what she wants to do with her life. I'm like, how do you not know what you want to do with your life? So. And I want to I want to build games. So this is I work for many different gaming studios. Oh, good God! I I did a I had to do a resume recently uh, for a uh, uh, bio at the school I work at, and I realized I've worked on 27 games. I'm like, holy snot! That's a lot of games. What were your personal favorites? <sighs> Bobber's World. Um, that was an interesting one. I used to work for a company called MySpace. Have you ever heard of them? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was fun. Um, uh, Wasteland Two, Wasteland Two was a lot of fun. That was the most most recent one. Um, but I did a lot of things with augmented reality with a program called Letters Alive. Let's see here. Um, I'm known in the area as Doctor Unity. For those who don't know, Unity is a, a type of gaming engine, uh, m much like Epic's Unreal. I was looking at some. Uh, there was some news stories out recently. I was, uh, could they could have been advertising pieces? I call them news stories, but right. you know, you know how that goes. Marketing is like you kind of can't tell the difference anymore. But anyway, that Unity engine is getting very uh, robust these days. Yeah. Yeah. I've been I've been using Unity since about nine years now, which is a long time for a gaming engine. It started out on Macs, but on Mac or as a, as sort of a, ga a sensible gaming engine for, that you could actually develop on for Macs, wasn't it? Well, uh, yeah. Originally, so here's what happened: uh, Unity came out. They were trying to the people who were at Unity were trying to build a game called Goo Ball, and they realized a lot. Of, like, think of it like Marble Madness, but with goo. Um, one of the things that they had a problem with was world editors back in those days. You had all these different programs you had to use. You know, you had to do one program for your level design, one program for your code, and, a, and you had to basically bring them all together. And they go, you know what? This is silly. We need to build a universal system that allows you to be like a world editor, uh, animation, and bring all this into one. So they built this to build Gooball. Now Gooball didn't didn't sell very well, but they realized the tools that they built. Hey, we can actually resell this and let people make games. Now. For the most part, I'm not a Mac-friendly person. The the statement I normally go around saying is, I'd rather be stabbed in the face with a rusty, salty ice pick than have to use a Mac. Um, I have <laughs> I have problems using it. I don't know what it is. It's maybe, maybe my own innate ability to figure out how to use the magic. I mean, look, I even have one right here. Yeah, and, I, mean, I mean, it's nice. It runs, Pos it runs POSIX operating system, at least. Yeah. I'm, a gra I'm a graphic designer, and I can tell you, I use Macs every day, and that thing is the spawn of the devil. Like okay. uh, you'll just put your hand on the mouse and your screen will just just every just things will fly around and it's just freaking sucks. So I mean, you know, because I grew up on a PC, I'm I'm trying to learn. So what happened was is Unity actually came out on a Mac, and I went to this company called Purple Turtles Purple Turtle Studios, and they're like, hey, we're going to be building an MMO. I'm like, okay, I know what an MMO is, and we're going to build in Unity. Well, I've heard of Unity when I was at MySpace. We were actually looking at Unity. I says, okay, and it's going to be worth a team of people, and we, we're going to build it, uh, an MMO. I says, okay, so I go to show up for the company, and they, and I'm looking around, and it's in like an old church. And I'm like, am I at the right location? I walk in, hey, James, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Uh, this is you know such and such. He's going to be your artist, uh, character designer. Uh, okay, and then this guy's going to be the 2D artist. 
Uh, okay. So, when do you want to get started? Uh, it's just us three? He goes, yeah. I'm building an MMO. So, I know not, I, I'm not... So, I had to use a Mac. I had to use Unity, which I knew nothing about. I had to work with two other people to build a MMO. So, from that, I researched about, you know, SmartFox server, how to use Unity. And within six months, we had... Well, actually, three months, we had a working prototype. Six months, we had something that was actually a sellable product. Not no, having a clue what I was doing. And uh, it was actually kind of cool. Uh, it was going to be re-released, and funding dried up, so it never got released to the public. But it was essentially a 3D version of Club Penguin, if you guys remember Club Penguin, before Disney mm -hmm. bought them out. Yep. It was, uh, and actually, it was, it was called Papercraft. The characters were created of paper, so uh, you know, uh, the, they would turn into like an airplane, or you know, they would fold into different things. And that was kind of cool. So that was probably that was a cool job to work for. Because um, I just had so much I didn't know that I had to learn. That's one of the reasons why I like teaching, because I always get to talk with the students, and you know they are teaching. Me, besides watching YouTube videos all day, they also listen to me, and they actually try to actually make games. That's actually kind of cool. Well, that's that's kind of what I was touching on. I mean, I mean, it, I think one of the reasons that you are successful is that you have no fear. I mean, after you learn about this stuff, you go, "Gosh, if I knew." how hard this engine or this idea or this concept or this development piece was going to be, maybe I wouldn't have gone with that, but it was your lack of fear that shot you through that pipe so well. Well, I mean, a friend of mine, he always says, he goes, James, you're like the, well, this is before uh, Galac uh, Galaxy Quest. Uh, he goes, you know, failure is not an option. It's like, no, it's not. I mean, I was given a task to build an MMO. I don't know what I'm doing. I gotta have you know, gotta be paid. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do what I can to get this done. I'm not gonna sit there and whine and cry about it. There's always a solution. People have been building MMOs for years. I mean, there's EverQuest, there's World of Warcraft. So it's not nothing new. Um, I have the internet at my disposal. What's the problem? What's the holdup? So. Well, that's 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 what I mean. You don't believe that those people that whine and cry exist, but they do, and that's why yeah. <laughs> teams of 80 and 90 people. Six years to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's usually. So, I'm I'm so used to working by myself, so I'm kind of like forced myself to go learn all this stuff. Um, yeah, I can do some research on the internet, and I can talk to some people, but I kind of like believe in myself, and I completely and utterly believe in myself. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna make the best Northwest game I can. So what I'm doing this weekend, actually, after this phone call, is I'm giving out. Um, I'm sending out uh, Puzzle 2 and Puzzle 3, which I can kind of, hang on, I can kind of show you as soon as I sh uh, share my screen. So this is Puzzle 2. Uh, I won't mute audio, but we'll let me see where I'm at. You're going to have my voice in here, but I have Snarf's real voice. Sadly, audio doesn't screen share last time I checked. But captions, I love captions. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the big things is I have subtitles in there. Now, this one with no lighting, so it says, you know, uh, how do you know my name? Everyone knows your name. It rhymes with barf. I'm beginning to see why you need help. So, you know, there's a lot of comedy kind of written like that. And anyway, so you say walk away. Uh, so you got to help him. Why is his mouth not working? Oh, it is. I'm just clicking through this to get to the actual puzzle. So, this puzzle... So what happens is, is your snark right here, okay? I don't know how well the frame rate is uh, streaming, but essentially, so Newford walks one direction. He can't turn around. So what you need to do is you need to get to a, a log and spin him around to get him through this puzzle. Like, if, if he gets near the crocodile, it'll start snapping at him. So then I can go over here and click. Start will swim over there. And then you do it another. Nicely done. That's clever. Ah! So that's what people are, uh, I want people to start testing is this one. Now... Because I wrote it, that's the bad thing about being an engineer. Because I wrote it, I know where to click. And I'm, I'm not going to say how to click it, but I, you know, I can do one click and get exactly to where I need to be to have him move. 
and then I got video of people playing it because that's one of the things I do is record people when they're playing the the, the demo, and I they're clicking like mad. They're like like clicking all over out here. I'm like, what are you? You know, I'm thinking to myself, what are you doing? But you don't want to give the answer away to the people because you want to find out what they do, and then uh, you know to see the big to see the overall map. I hate watching people beta test that are beta test anything I've written. Yeah. <laughs> But you learn a lot. You, that's what it is. That's no, but you, you get the urge to help them, though, and that's so hard. It is. It is, it is really difficult. So um, that's one of the big things I try to do is I have to keep my mouth shut because I'm like, you know, I have two young kids. Uh, I have an older child, but I have two young kids, and, you know, you want to help them. You give them their clothes to put on, and you can see they're struggling. You just want to reach forward and just, like, you want to help them get their arm through the, uh, the, the shirt. And, like, no, you got to let them do it on themselves, and it's really difficult. So, so from, from the perspective of someone who, as someone who teaches the fundamentals of software, de, software, de, uh, software design and development, uh, what would your sort of top tips be for for people aspiring to develop uh, develop something themselves? You know, even if it's something qu uh, quite small for a game jam or something. You know, the obligatory how, uh, how uh, what should what should you do if you want to get into this industry? Question. Um, I tell people depending on what you're going to be, if you're going to be a uh, uh, let's just say go with an engineer, for example. Um, with an engineer, build something small. I always get these people, constantly, my pet peeve with these people that want to... I actually had a guy, who, well, this is an artist, who wanted to model London. And I'm like, why? He's like, because it's pretty. I was like, well, that's fine. Why do you need it in your... What are you going to do with it in your game? He's like, well, I'm going to run down this tunnel. Are you going to see London? What's going to be in the background? Well, then don't model London. Take a picture of it and, and just, you know... Take some artistic liberty to it. You don't need to model it if you're not going to show it. I get a lot of people that play these games, like you know, whether it's Halo or Doom or or some or it, uh, World of Warcraft, and they're like, "That's great," but they want to build something like that. Don't build World of Warcraft for your first game. I mean, it wasn't my first game. Make Pong. Make asteroids. Make uh, astro. I see. Ast I tell people to make asteroids, Breakout, and Pong, because those basically gives you all the dynamics that you need. To work with just about any kind of game, because um, you're working with uh, you know bouncing and gravity and physics, it, it, it takes care of all that. So, I want people to start making smaller things. Don't keep thinking large scale. Um, I have I have students because I have to build a game and well, they, students have to build a game in 11 weeks, um, and they only have six hours of instructions a week, so they have essentially 66 hours a week. And I go look. Think about this way. Think about you screwed around for 10 weeks. You did nothing for 10 weeks but go eat at Chick-fil-A, okay, or play video games. If you had to get with your group of people and in three days, you know, more or less 72 hours, on a weekend, build a game, what can you build? And that right there, their mentality changes. Oh, wow, you know, three days. What can we really build in three days? And you can start seeing them, them processing going, I can't build this and this and this. And that helps out a lot. But that's been my biggest peeve is people always try to make these monstrous games when they have no background into it. That actually know. ties into a conversation we were having. Well, it was more of a bitching session. I call it a conversation, <laughs> but it was more like, like I was like yelling at people. But uh, just to date this, if you happen to be watching this video like 10 years in the future, uh, Mighty Number no. 9, which was a big Kickstarter, made millions of dollars, came out like what, a couple weeks ago, I think it was. It's getting completely wrecked by the critics, and, and people are livid about that game. And I look at it, and it was uh, supposed to be a successor to Mega Man, in case the game's been completely forgotten 10 years from now, which it very well might. Um, uh, and I look at that game, and it's got this 3D engine, and it's all, like, fancy with the lighting and the stuff. And I'm, I'm thinking, uh, if you had done a Kickstarter and made this game that was just a 2D side-scroller, people would have been ecstatic about it. You yeah. know, just some Mega Man-style game, the pixel graphics keep it simple, but the classic failure of all these Kickstarters is they all try to make these like mega. Uh, it's exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. These mega huge 3D engines with the fanciness and stuff, where people would have been, like people would have been completely happy with just a two-dimensional fun uh, side scroller. Well, it'd have been a heck of a lot easier to do. Yeah, I told my backers, you know, I wanted to bring back the point-and-click feel, and I think I have brought back the point-and-click feel. But the biggest thing is, since this is Larry's IP, I don't want to release a half-assed product. So uh, I had Microsoft back in Febu February, yeah, well, February, February or March. Let's just say February, but it could be March. 
um, they actually let me come to the Microsoft Store in Perimeter Mall here in Atlanta. And they set up, they had SnarkQuest running on all their monitors in the background, and they gave me all these Surface tablets to test, and they set up a little booth for me. So I had people come by and test that, because I didn't want my backers to think I'm going to give them a half-assed product. So I'm basically doing the same thing. I'm making sure I test the living snot out of this before I give it out, put it up on Steam. Because right now i got episode one partly on Steam, because I know it's, it's, it's pretty stable. Um, obviously, there'll be bugs found later, but I, I got to make sure this is the best quality product I can make. So that's why I do all these different iterations of testing and over and over and over again. And sometimes, it's just like when uh, script reading with table reads. So you'll read the dialogue, and I'll be like, Walter, I can't say this. You know, that, Han, that famous Han Solo line, you can write this stuff, but you can't say it. There's a lot of times where, uh, even in this scene, well, you guess you can't see right here, um, this scene right here where... There's a, there's a series of events that you need to do in order to get the gem off the, the ogre's head. And I'm like, so what happens if you mess this up? They're like, oh, we didn't think about that. So we had to kind of change the dialogue um, to match what was actually going to happen. And then sometimes the animation didn't play out the way we wanted it to. Um, and it's like, okay, the way the attack cycle goes, the character moves. So we had to do some camera cuts in order to change that. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's, it's great having to wake up every morning and uh, you know take a shower, go upstairs to my office, and work on StarQuest because it's it's like it's my own project, my own baby. I just have 652 backers. I need to make sure I'm very 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 pleased with it. Which I guess is everyone here on this call. I think everyone back me. <laughs> did everyone back me? <laughs> we all did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I, will, I do want to point out, too, that there are a lot of people who release games, um, you know, Kickstarter or however, and it seems to be kind of a rarity that people are doing boxes anymore, but I really appreciate that you seem to get it, that it's not it's not just the box, it's everything that goes with oh, it. Oh, yeah. And you're totally, like, that's so rare, and it's just, I don't know, like, it's me, it's one of <laughs> yeah, especially yeah, especially for us. I mean, we're that's that's our wheelhouse, man. It, it is. The question that I have is: that, is there a game? Is there a puzzle that interactively uses the cloth map? I I, I can't answer that question just yet. Okay. <laughs> I think we got our answer. <laughs> that's like I was at a, I had an interview at Momocon with a a guy named. Uh, Wolf, Black Wolf, Wolf Black. Feel bad, I keep forgetting. I'm horrible at name. Give me numbers, I'm great at, but names not so much. Anyway, yeah, Black Wolf is his name. And he was like, "Are there gonna be Steam cards?" I'm like, uh, "I'm I'm I'm hooked up with Larry Elmore, you know, famous family, uh, famous famous fantasy artist. Yeah, pretty sure there's gonna be some Steam cards out there too. But it's the tangible stuff. I remember, you know, being younger and going to Sears and you know, looking at these games, you know, they had Prodigy Internet out there, and, and uh, what was the other one? Prodigy and uh, Net... No. Genie? No. CompuServe? That's Compu it, CompuServe, when you had that that number for your email address, essentially. And I remember going to Sears, and I was like, you know, I want, I want that game. And it was like $50. This was back in the 80s. You know, a game was $50. That actually was worth something back then. Yeah, and one of the great things, I, I know I... Led to this, and I stopped when I was talking about Bard's Tale. But like the 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 coded wheel, and remember in Bard's Tale, you had that coded wheel, or you had to open up the book to a specific page to look at a certain line. That's what we got in uh in a lot of other games back in the 80s. And now when we were talking about Leisure Suit Larry, we, you know they asked you questions to basically figure out if you were your age, like when did Neil Armstrong land on the moon or whatever like that. And you had to type in the number. Or and, pick and, and depending how correct you are, you got to see more or less boobs. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> and um, I, I totally got a parent to help me. Yeah, well, I mean that's one of the things that I enjoyed about it. It was like a game within a game, but yet out of the game. I, it's like if you follow that logic, that does make sense. You bought a game, you're in the game, which has a, like a mini game, but you have to be out of the game because you're not in the game to play it. I was like, what are you it immediately about? puts you in in the game world if you've got if you've got that relationship between your between your feelies and your books and exactly. it yeah. sort of teleports you in. 
Yes, and that, that's one of the things that I, I liked about it. I was like, I love that. And I love that coded wheel. I remember, you know, I have to pull it back and look at all these numbers. I'm like, what kind of math is involved to get these numbers like that? And I'm like, you know, it was just that that movement, of that touchy feely thing. And I was like, I love this. Okay, same thing with uh, uh, Populous. You know, you had that little book that you couldn't you couldn't photocopy. Oh yeah, you can photocopy it. Um, <laughs> they, made, they made sure that you couldn't photocopy it. There you go. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, so I love that tangible feelingness of it. You know, getting bad blood or getting Ultraman, the little figure and the cloth map and the little coin. Um, we did try to get coins for uh, Snarf Quest, but they want to have a print run of 55,000. I'm like, I can't print 55,000 coins. I mean, it's I, people know Snarf Quest, or some people know of Snarf Quest. I see a lot of really har hardcore, dedicated fans. I just did a convention here called Terminus here in Atlanta. Uh, two Saturdays ago, and this guy walks in. He's like, you're just doing this to make me feel old. <laughs> I'm like, uh, what? And he's like, oh my god, I can't believe there's a Snarf Quest game. I'm like, yeah, I'm working on it. So this was a convention. It wasn't that big. Um, I didn't have any problem with it, but there was a lot of dedicated Snarf Quest fans, and there's no place for these Snarf Quest fans to actually get together and talk about this. So if they happen to you know, do a search on eBay or just on the Google uh, to type in Star Quest or Star Quest Tales, that that's when they will know about me. But yeah, I mean, I want to, I want to be able to, you know, while I'm playing my game, or something like that. You know, just look at these little figures and go, wow, this is really good. Or just look at the back, and then you realize, oh, this is a trash 80. It's like, oh, okay. So you know, you get like other little jokes, but not inside the game. You're actually touching the the material. And like when you look at the map, and you know, there's certain things that are said in the map that's going to lead to other parts. It's like. Now I get it. So that's that's what I love doing. And that's what I really miss about when you download when you download something from Steam directly. You don't have that. It's just yeah, I can play this game, immerse myself in it a little bit, and then walk away. It's not like I can look at my shelf going, you see that? I bet you if I put that and that together and this and that. So you're the yeah. last. You're the last of the golden age programmers. I mean, you're bringing this all back. No, I'm not trying to date you. You know what I mean. Uh, yeah. What I'm saying is that you're still using those techniques, which has almost become a lost art. It is. It is a lost art. I think um, when Wasteland 2 came out, uh, they actually have cloth maps, and they're obviously they they did redid Bard's Tale. They're doing a depending on look at things. Bard's Tale 4 or the new Bard's Tale, and you know they're going to bring back some of that, but. Um, a lot of the younger generation, like my, my son, you know, he has an iPad. He has no comprehension of a box. And yet you walk up to him and he sees me wearing the shoes. He's like, Snarf Quest, can we play Snarf Quest? I'm like, yeah. So we'll actually play Snarf Quest. He'll sit next to me and he'll say, well, move over there. We'll move that crate. Why is the bunny uh, running away? Because he doesn't, he got the carrot. Ah. So I mean, he's five, okay? And he's figuring this stuff out. And he's starting to become, you know, more attached to me because of this. And I think that has to do with like a relationship building when you have this box. There's something about having the box tangible, more powerful. Exactly. I mean, my son is now 23, and uh, I, I often wonder, I mean, in the age of the music CDs, or not the CDs, but online music, he doesn't get to see all this stuff. He doesn't get to actually hold the physical album in his hand and he doesn't get to read the liner notes and he doesn't get to look at that thing. You know, I, I, I asked him, how do you clean your pot? He said, what? Oh, never mind. <laughs> uh, just, but I mean, it's just that idea that, that that tangible item that's in your hand, you know? Wear the cardboard Sgt. Pepper mustache. You have to. It's part of the experience, you know? But doesn't that maybe speak a little bit to that generation's obsession with the cell phone in their hand, with the item they're carrying? All of their content comes packaged in this one thing that is almost an extension of who they are at this point. I mean, it's creepy for us old folks. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it's different. The iPod or the, the iPhone is the thing that's delivering that experience, that content to them. So... I kind of get it, but I mean it's not the same, and it, I feel old because I don't I don't get it, but I can see where they're coming from with that. I so, think with the kids, the the phone is a tool and not so much a piece of art. Yes. Have you ever tried to take that tool away from a child? Yes, <laughs> on a regular basis. It's more than a tool. It is more than a tool. 
uh, will uh, will there be box? Uh, will there be any? Have you got any sort of channel plan for selling box editions through to non Kickstarter backers, or is that definitely a one off thing? Well, what I want to do is, my Kickstarter backers are very important to me, so they're going to get a special box. Um, then there was the Larry Elmore edition, which Larry is actually designing a a cover and a back cover, which he's actually going to be drawing. Um, Larry was cool. tied up until just recently. Um, I I talked to him last night, in fact, because um, he saw the map. He's like, "That's that's funny." There's there's some parts on the on the map. He's like, "That's funny." I'm like, "Yeah, thank you." Uh, so I had to want to get his blessing on that. And then at Gen Con this year, I'm actually going to have this box, uh, these miniatures, and if if the if the gods like me, I'm going to have the cloth map in the box available for Gen Con and uh, uh, Dragon Con uh, you know, at the convention, and then I'll put it up on my website. So I'm just trying to figure out a good price point. I mean, how much would... Now, granted, you guys are a different crowd only because you guys are collectors, but realistically, what's a good number for a, a box, a uh, set of miniatures, 11 of them, and a cloth map. The cloth map is, is it 12? Hang on. It's like 12 by 17. So it's a pretty good size. And the steam key? And the and steam key, yeah, I'm sorry. And the steam key. Oh, the power power is overwhelming here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't want to insult anybody either. I don't want to overprice or underprice. I can't believe you're asking us for advice. I know, but remember... <laughs> They're completely biased and skewed. I got that. Yeah, but we also like to justify the fact that we are prepared to lay down, frankly, insane amounts of money for for uh, for elderly cardboards. So yeah. you know, we are not representative. Um. Who's going first? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the answer at the end. So I just <laughs> want to hear what you guys say. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Uh, I, I will. Type I think this. You... Hold on, hold on. I'm actually going to type. Let me control N. I'm typing a number on the screen right now. Okay. We're in trouble. So, he has nothing up his sleeve. Yeah. Seventy to seventy dollars. I I think you'd I think uh, given that you I think you'd have to be looking at somewhere between uh, somewhere in the sort of uh, for it to be really properly saleable. I think the fifty sixty dollar mark tends to be that tends to be the sweet spot for mod, uh, for modern box uh, box things. Very true. My fault. My initial thought was sixty five. Oh yeah. Hmm. $60. I'm trying to keep, do I, what do I win? I'm trying to keep the 80s. box. <laughs> it's good because I only back digital. Yeah. I, I am trying to buy me one now, Joe. The 1985 prices from Bard's Tale. So if, if Bard's Tale can charge $49.99 back then and they give you all this stuff, why can't I do it too? So. I think it is the thing that the sweet because spot price for games hasn't changed, although uh, although everyone's currency has uh, inflated quite significantly. Yes. But, that, but the but the but the but the kind of num numeric amount of cash people are prepared to hand over, and you get this with when you see stuff moving between international regions because. Uh, there's there's a, there's a joke in the uh, uh, it's quite amusing if you're in uh, I used to live in the UK, and. Uh, you, the do to get work out what something would cost in Britain, you just took the dollar price and swapped the dollar for a pound sign. You didn't yeah. calculate, do a value calculation. It is just literally the number, the uh, the round number people are prepared to hand over for, uh, right. for a game. But you still have to find that sweet spot between um, value for the money and I gotta make a living. We deal a lot with at work sometimes with uh, pricing on stuff, and it's uh, it's a tricky thing because you, if you price it too high, obviously no one will buy it because no one can afford it. But at the same time, as a product, and this is a weird thing as in a modern sense because I don't think in the olden days they really viewed things this way. But you don't want to price it like a dollar either because then that people view it as being cheap yep. or like a piece of crap, or you know the the, the value expectation on a dollar product is much lower than the value expectation on a fifty dollar product. So it's like it's not as easy as people think to uh, price something out like that. Yeah, I mean, I was getting offers for seventy-five, hundred dollars a piece. I'm like, I can't do that. That's, that's I, you know, the whole purpose of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring back my childhood, bring back the '80s. So I figured that was the best thing I could do. Yeah, but you can't eat in today's market with '80s money. <laughs> that's true. I got that. So I remember when I was. I remember uh, I was working in in Alaska um, at, at a very young age because 
the laws there are a little bit more lenient. And I remember making pretty good money there. And then moving to Florida and then getting like two dollars and five cents an hour. I'm like, you know, I was making like seven in Alaska in in the early '80s, but uh, came down to lower 48. And <laughs> no, no, it doesn't work like that down here. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I remember one what I things I used to do is I used to. Uh, and I would do odd jobs, you know, whether it's lawn care or babysitting or whatever, to get that fifty dollars to go buy Bard's Tail. And then I would spend hours. And then I remember fighting Mangar, and, and I didn't have my thief far enough, and I did a stupid move, and I turned around, I punched a filing cabinet, and broke my left pinky. I mean, my right <laughs> pinky. And I'm like, it's a game, James. But I love the game so much. So. So you gotta up the price maybe a little just to pay for you know possible hospital payments. And things like <laughs> no, no, I, I'm I'm a lot better now. So, but yeah, I think that having the the miniatures and the cloth and the box and the steam key, um, it should be pretty good. You're amazing. You're absolutely amazing, and 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 I think it's you're and you're honorable as well. I'm trying to be. I mean, I, I'm not in this to make a gobs of money. Um, I'm doing this because I love the product. I mean, I could easily charge probably 75, maybe 80 bucks with all that on there, because I see special editions for like Assassin's Creed or what have you go, you know, go quite high. Or looking on the Facebook, you know, the big box collection, what people are paying for for games. I'm like, no, I'm I'm not in it for uh, scamming people. I'm in it because I like what I'm doing. So. Well, we're gonna we're gonna cut the feed here, James. You're doing a service to. Gaming history, my friend, and uh, service to uh, fantasy art. I uh, appreciate you coming and spending some time with us. Uh, thanks, thanks for so your much. time. Come back and show us more of your box games in future. Oh yeah, uh, basically they're. I can tell you they're all go- uh, they're all SSI Gold Edition, Silver Edition signed. So we like those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we like those. Road War 2000, <laughs> Road War Europe, yeah, all the Dragonland series. So yeah, it's pretty good. But yeah, no problem. Hey guys, thank you very much for having me. Don't forget, don't forget to go visit snarfquesttales.com. We got a store up. Remember, there's only three of these left in existence after this one goes Monday morning. Awesome. Not one, three now. All right, guys. Thanks, so thanks for watching, James. Thanks for being here. We'll see you on the flip side. Take care, man. Bye bye.